Hi, can all of you hear me all right? I don't know how well these microphones are working, but Akiva, can you hear me in the back? Great. Uh, this is a panel on how to try to translate or reach a global and diverse audience with a massive open online course. Uh, all of us have some experience in struggling with different aspects of this. Uh, I'm not going to try to set a very broad general framework. I'll simply open up the session by mentioning a few issues that I've had to contemplate and that may overlap with some of the issues my fellow panelists are looking at, and then some of the sample solutions that I've had to try to choose, some of the choices that I've had to make, which may not be choices others would make. So three initial issues in thinking about this problem. First, assumptions about their knowledge, prior knowledge. Because of course, um, no prerequisites or no formal prerequisites. So you have to think to what level am I pitching this class? I'm teaching a, a MOOC on modern world history. So one of the decisions I have to make is, is this modern world history the way I would teach it to the 14-year-old, which is the standard age at which this course is given in basic instruction in the United States? Do I pitch it to the 17-year-old who might be taking an AP world history class, prepared to take an AP world history exam for credit? In other words, the smart high school student. Again, using a purely American context, but there are versions of that kind of context in other countries. Or C, do I pitch this to a University of Virginia student, almost all of whom were in the top 10% of their high school graduating class, and therefore who are already starting with a certain level of cultural and historical literacy, though not as high as one might hope. <laughs> um, and it wasn't that high, much higher when I taught at Harvard either. So first point, assumptions about knowledge. Second issue, no supplemental resources. You cannot assume that the students to whom you're offering this course have ready access to outside readings, can purchase the textbooks you wish they would purchase, even if they had the money to purchase them and wanted to, for lots of different reasons that some of you will have encountered. Books aren't available for sale in some countries. There are actually substantive censorship issues and copyright issues and so on. So very limited supplemental resources. And then that has to influence course design. So assumptions about their knowledge, assumptions about the available external resources they can tap. Uh, often what they will tap is do additional research on Wikipedia. Um, and third, cultural context of several kinds. Um, in my case, teaching a course on modern world history, uh, cultural context in a course like mine is a total minefield. There are literally hundreds of minds I can step on in teaching this course. There are minds I can step on in every single one of the 92 video presentations I offer over a period of 14 weeks. And in the discussion forums, you'll find that I have stepped on several of these minds, uh, some deliberately and one or two uh, not deliberately. So the, just to give you a sense of the choices that I've made in constructing my class, for instance, one. Um, uh, I pitched it at a relatively high level in that the course is set in the assumptions about knowledge exactly at the level of my University of Virginia students. But that's a, a very deliberate choice. I find very gratifyingly that almost all of my, that a great many of my online students are perfectly able to engage the material at that level. <clears throat> which doesn't assume a lot of prior historical knowledge, but it assumes a certain basic geographic literacy, a uh, certain basic ability to engage the chronologies, and so on. You don't have to explain uh, just certain basic words uh, the way you would at some other levels. Second, uh, one choice is you ha and, and this is a choice I think anyone would have to make, in, certainly in teaching a course like mine, you have to set a higher bar in preparing your presentations than you would ever set in the course you teach at a residential university. 
I can make factual statements in a lecture hall with 100 students there, and if I tripped up on a particular date or name, I'll never hear anything else about it. Maybe one student will come up to me after class who is an especially bright and eccentric student and reproach me about it. And then I can make my private admission. When you put stuff up on the web that goes around the world and tens of thousands of people are viewing it, viewing it repeatedly and studying it microscopically, even down to commenting on whether they think my hair is graying, <laughs> uh, this is a high bar. And it is not forgiving of mistakes. Students like nothing better than to jump on factual errors that they think you have made and where they have caught you out. So it's a, and if, and if you think about in transcribing my presentations, you're probably talking in my case of, I would guess, at least 200,000 words of spoken material that has to be uh, fact-checked at a fairly high level. So it, high bar. Uh, third uh, point, and this is just as a technical point to emphasize, uh, uh, well, not really just a technical point. Not a lowest common denominator class, um, culturally or, or in interpretation. Uh, it's a deliberate choice I made. So I make some fairly strong interpretations. A lot of people are not going to agree with those interpretations. I'm very interested in why questions rather than just doing what happened questions. That takes me squarely into the world of interpretation. And that's going to be a controversial world. That's a choice that I make in the structure of the class. And different people will make different choices. Another choice I made is my class is not structured as if it mimicked a textbook. It is not as comprehensive as a textbook would be. Not all regions and countries and issues are treated as if they are equal. My class is not um, as politically correct in some senses as a textbook publisher might feel he needs to or she needs to be. And so in that sense, I've also made some choices that are potentially controversial, although my students haven't complained uh, intensely about them. I do try very hard to make sure my course is not centered from a uniquely American perspective, though occasionally the United States does play an important part in world history, just from time to time. And my fourth and last point is a technical point for a cultural literacy and the ability to translate your material different audiences, it really is worth looking at the transcriptions. Students, especially in other cultures, will rely very heavily on the transcripts as, in effect, their subtitles to help them follow, especially if their English is limited. And uh, Coursera provides some rough transcriptions. They, are, uh, they ain't great. I, I understand that the, it, they need to provide a relatively inexpensive way of doing transcriptions of a lot of material. Uh, next time around, I will need to, in, I will invest a fair amount of time and effort, and time and effort of others, in refining those transcripts and getting up, them, getting up to a high level of English language quality, and then try to see what money is available to try to get translations in other languages up to similar levels of quality. When I went into this course, I didn't pay much attention to the transcription process, except as an obligation for ADA compliance. That's a, that's a piece of American legislation. Um, I'm now much more sensitized to the significance of transcriptions as a really important bridge to make the course more accessible to a lot of different people around the world. And then I'll just stop there, and I'd like to turn the floor over to Bill Brieger of Johns Hopkins University. Michael slides are first, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, to well, then we'll take it in the order of the slide presentation. So, Michael Ferrison from the University of London. Okay, thank you, Philip, and uh, and welcome everyone. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here in this very, very pertinent, and relevant topic. I will try and keep to to time. Um, and I've won the battle of PowerPoints, so I'm going. <laughs> I'm going before Bill. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to do, first of all, I'll, um, I'll briefly touch on um, the University of London International Programmes to give you a little bit of context of how I see the global classroom and some of the issues that, that we have at the University of London. And I'll pick on some of the key topics and, and, and pick up some of the points, perhaps, that uh, dovetail with what Philip has covered. 
Um, and by the way, I came in late last night, so I'm still attuning myself. My accent is an English one, you'll have picked up. Um, I'm, I'm being looked at with some scowls early morning, um, so hopefully the pace of my addiction and so on is, is clear enough for you. I will look at you intensely, and if I see you nodding off, I'll know that, uh, that I need to change. But I have just finished the series of The Sopranos, so if I do change, it may end up being New, <laughs> New Jersey, you know. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm easier with that one than Michael Caine, so apologies. Okay, University of London International Programme. Some of you may have heard of us. We are the world's oldest provider of degrees through flexible learning. Over 150 years. Um, as you probably know, the UK system is based on Royal Charter in terms of degree awarding powers. Uh, at that time, it was Queen Victoria who signed our Royal Charter. Relevant here because actually... Um, at that time, there was a change in that charter which said that students could apply to be students of the University of London, follow the University of London curriculum, and present themselves for assessment through independent study, which was a massive thing at the time, and an extremely innovative uh, move for the, uh, for the faculty at that time to decide upon. And this immediately opened up um, the University of London programmes, primarily then King's College and the University College London, UCL, the two key colleges. It's, it's grown um, to have 18 colleges and institutes since then. So as of today, we've now grown to over 53,000 students in over 180 countries studying for degree programmes through the University of London. Um, and 60% approximately of that 53,000 get local tuition, so those of you who are struggling with the blended learning solution and models that, that may or may not fit your particular institutions, um, we have a system whereby we recognise 70 plus institutions in some of those 180 countries that provide local support around the curriculum and the core materials that we provide for distance learning students. University of London is a federal structure, so we have within the international programmes um, collective 12 lead colleges which include King's College London, London School of Economics LSE, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Queen Mary, UCL and so on. A lot of uh, very big university names in their own right and they operate under the University of London through the International Academy which deliver distance learning programmes and that is an academic centre in its own right. Um, you won't be able to see some of the detail on that, but if you go to our website, if it's of interest to you, you'll see where the 53,000 students are dotted. I'll not try and interpret that live because I'm colourblind as well, so I'll get into a right mess. Um, just to say, broadly speaking, our undergraduate population is focused primarily in Asia, Asia Pacific and Western Europe. For our postgraduate programmes, it tends to be more skewed towards Western Europe and the Americas. Um, that's broadly speaking the, the coverage. Um, our largest country is Singapore, where we have over 12,000 students doing University of London programmes. Okay, those are some of the, the key points I wanted to touch upon. Um, the, the fact that we have already these global classrooms, we have 57 programmes, 29 postgraduate, 28 undergraduate, right the way through from veterinary science through to tropical diseases, law, economics, business, accountancy, finance and so on. Also humanities through the Bachelor of Divinity, uh, English language courses, and so on. So we have sub-communities within all of those programmes of global classrooms that, that we struggle with. We are putting on five MOOCs uh, from June this year, which cover some of the content of some of those programmes. And, of course, we will need to uh, scale up a lot of the, the issues that we, that we currently face through our full programmes. And um, within the global classroom, what Philip said I think is terribly important in terms of the curriculum and learning outcomes design. So what you want to get out of the, uh, of the students, what you're looking to assess, what it is that you're, you're seeking to achieve is absolutely crucial in defining what goes on in that global classroom. So that's got to be where it starts. Within that, there are different learning styles, of course, and of, of, of particular interest there in the global classroom the different cultural movements that may make certain styles of presentation, certain styles of assessment more or less challenging. There are a number of very good research articles <coughs> in this area which have looked at different cultural
preferences, which I'll happily uh, load up onto the sub-forum that we've got, rather than um, cover them uh, here just now. But there are clearly areas which you need to think through in terms of planning out your MOOC, um, of who you're wanting to attract and what kind of outcome you're looking to achieve. And that will clearly uh, define the tools that you want to work with. Okay, so some practical points which I thought within five minutes is as much as I can, um, I can touch upon and hopefully give you some hooks for some questions later on. Um, I think again, at the, at the plenary and also um, Philip's point, it's absolutely crucial that we prepare the students for what's expected. What, however you design your curriculum and what's to be achieved, it's absolutely crucial that the students understand that and understand how they're going to be assessed up front. It's a fairly simple thing, but it's an easy thing to get wrong. And certainly with scalable numbers of 180,000 students potentially in any one classroom, getting it wrong means a, a very big uh, problem putting it right again. So induction material, tasters of the MOOCs, you know, what, what kind of coverage there will be, what kind of discussion forum expectations there are, what kind of tools of assessment they need to prepare themselves for and so on. Gradually, as they become more, more accustomed with doing MOOCs, hopefully they'll become more familiar. But certainly at this stage, it's very important that you prepare them well and have some introductory sessions, some introductory uh, emails to let them know it's about to start, to prepare them for study, to try and get them geared up, to um, get their brains motivated uh, and moving towards uh, thinking of, of studying in week one. In terms of teaching methods, um, there are different tools that you can use, and, and uh, as Philip mentioned, there's, there's various ways that you can engage through discussion forums. You can get teaching assistants to help uh, keep momentum in those forums. Again, very, very difficult to get the level of intervention right and scalable for the number of students. So think very carefully about that uh, in, in planning any engagement, and make sure, again, the students understand that you'll be online for one hour in an evening, or that you will not be online uh, during the week, but if a thread builds up to over 100, um, 100 different posts, that you may well engage in that. So make it clear uh, what the expectation should be for students in delivering your MOOC. And, and think through carefully any synchronous activity. Of course, time zones is a, is a, is a fairly important um, issue with regards to global classrooms and, and, and students being able to key in and, and being excluded from that activity. And also ensure the learning activities, therefore, can be accessed by <coughs> passive learners. Um, I think we've all um, probably suffered in different ways, either as a student ourselves or delivering as an instructor, um, good and bad face-to-face -face tuition. It's absolutely crucial that we, we get the balance right. We know that in a, in, a, in a classroom seminar of around 20 to 25 students, you'll get a very vocal a group of students. You'll get some that chip in from time to time and look with a fairly puzzled glance and, and maybe ask the odd question. Then you'll get a, a part of that group uh, who will not speak at all. Now some of those, um, in my experience anyway, certainly in teaching finance, are very good at actually piecing it all together and will come in with the killer question at the end or will provide a synopsis which pulls it all together and all of a sudden you thought somebody switched off, they've actually They've actually done everything that's been required and they've learned by people asking daft questions and getting a response from the instructor. When you scale that up across uh, MOOC delivery, it's really key that you don't <coughs> lose sight of those passive learners and try and use them in their contribution. So finding ways of, of getting them to summarise, reflect on forum activity and so on are ways in which you can really include them and very valuable for them. I'm getting a one minute sign floated at me, so I'll, I'll finish up with uh, some of the assessment tools. Progressively, and as MOOCs are delivered more than once, it's absolutely crucial that you build in sustainably the design of your assessment, particularly formative assessment. Think through the obvious problems, the obvious errors, and try and then build in intelligent feedback. So if there are short quizzes, put in the answers for the distractors. Why have they chosen that distractor? What was the reason that they've They've just missed the, the key point. Build that into your design of your materials. You'll get the benefit when it's run two, three, four, five, six times. If you, if you do that well, you get a very sustainable um, learning material set. Obviously less easy in humanities where there's no necessarily right and wrong answer. 
But in those cases, it's, it's really important to build in collaborative learning so they learn of each other. And in particular, an area that we didn't touch on in the plenary, but is actually there, if a number of students do credits through a number of MOOCs, where does the development of their critical thinking come? Who takes ownership of that critical thinking? Is it expected that each MOOC will have uh, students understand how to think critically, how to question accepted knowledge? Again, culturally not easy for some categories of learners to actually do that, to question the, the tutor's authority, that there's no right and wrong answer. It's very uncomfortable for a number of different cultures. So think through how that critical thinking can be nurtured, particularly when you move through year two, year three of undergraduate programmes where students actually haven't learned those skills yet, a really important part of, of coming out of uh, a university education. I'm going to leave questions till the end, and I'll pass over to, to Bill. Thank you for your attention. You're all awake. It's, it's Jerusalem. I do apologise. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jerusalem is from the UCSF School of Nursing. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Welcome. I'm very excited about talking about this topic, especially since I've, I'm, I feel as, as if I'm a global citizen myself, having grown up in Ethiopia, lived in China for m several years of my life, and then um, having the opportunity and privilege to have been educated in the United States and now teaching at UCSF. So very excited about talking a little bit about this. I launched uh, one of the pilot MOOCs at UCSF in January. It was a five-week course on contraception, culture, and consequences. Just wanted to quickly show you a little bit about our students and um, give you a taste of of where they're coming from. Over 140 countries represented in uh, our student population. Of about 21,000 students signed up for the course. Not all completed, but many, about 8,000 of them viewed the uh, videos. But 140 countries represented. And just a little bit of a few of them. A doctor that's living in Nigeria, an Iranian biomedical science student in Kuala Lumpur, a Peace Corps volunteer in the Caribbean with a bachelor's degree in international relations, a high school student in Las Vegas, and then a Palestinian medical student studying in Tana University in Egypt. So really a wide range of uh, students. 50% of them were non-English speakers, which, which is a huge, which is a big deal when we think about putting these courses together, really thinking about language. Um, this is something that I do every day. I work with immigrant populations in Oakland and San Francisco, and I'm always thinking about language, thinking about how I speak, thinking about my handouts that I'm giving to patients. Is this, an, is this in, in English that people are going to be able to understand? And especially since we're talking about healthcare, something as complex as contraception, really important to, to think about. What was interesting here, 70% of them had a four-year college degree. So already they are st uh, starting out very similar to most of my students. I teach in a graduate program, so nurse practitioner students um, studying to become nurse practitioners and midwives. So this was pretty com comparable when you, when you think about it. Age distribution, again, 15 to 74, very, very wide range, and 80% of them were female. Again, these are those that responded to the survey at the end. So this might not capture the whole 23,000 that signed up, mm -hmm. but those that responded to the survey were about uh, 5,000, 4,000 folks that responded to some of this demographic information. So a couple of things. Pre-launch, I really, we, I spent some time thinking about how am I going to, uh, you know, again, I've been teaching this content for about five years already uh, online to the nurse practitioner students, but I thought, am I going to have to change this up completely? What should I do? And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I really didn't change much. I tried to really impart some of the basics about each method and contraception, keeping it very, very simple. But one thing that we did do is we did create a glossary, a glossary of abbreviations and term, med some medical terms that were going to be in my slides that might not be um, clearly understood. Very important to, to also include a, the global context. I, as our speaker earlier was talking about, really not necessarily the, the U.S. perspective only, but really the global context in, in contraception. When I talked about one method, I said, well, in this country, this, this is the name of this method, in this country, this, so really uh, making sure that uh, wherever a person was living and working, they were able to use that information. Um, very important that the video lectures, I love the Coursera platform in that there were the 15 to 20 minute lectures, so I really had to keep things very streamlined and simple. Every single video had the same 
headings and outlines, and, and I think that really helps um, uh, keep it uh, uh, very, very um, clear. The subtops, I was very, very fortunate in terms of supplemental materials. There are, there's a lot, there's a wealth of stuff online that is free and accessible to most folks. So the, the text that I use in my current course is Managing Contraception, but that, a mini version of it was available online and free. So, you know, all of these students could just download it if they had access to internet and have that content. The WHO website was something that I used very, very uh, as another text, as another resource as well. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of supplemental materials that I didn't have to worry about. My students at UCSF, the students that I taught on the MOOC, had almost uh, equal access to those materials, very, very similar materials. Um, and and what, <coughs> what I liked about the supplemental materials is I felt like the students on the, in the MOOC were able then to use the supplemental materials if they wanted to get more in depth about the topic, or so they could either go up or down. I would provide the videos, then with the supplemental, they could go further in their work. So this was some of the pre-launch strategies that I used. While the course is in session, lots of stuff does come up. So it really is essential that you have excellent support. I had a fantastic TA who was an expert in the material, so was able to be quickly, quick, quickly responsive, but also the technical and the curriculum design expertise, where somebody was able to really look at what was going on and quickly change a rubric when it was necessary. Um, and where that came in handy was for the peer assessments. So sometimes uh, terminology, for example, there was a huge discussion on some of the threads around plagiarism. You know, what does plagiarism mean? Re what does plagiarism really mean? And that, that discussion uh, could have gone out of hand without the assistance of a, a good technical eye and somebody to define it clearly and to make things more equitable. So really having a, a clear rubric that is going to help um, all ends of the spectrum in terms of the learner ability. So a lot of learner-driven solutions as well that I saw. So we, you know, we, we think about these, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? The learners themselves in these discussion threads did a lot of some of the balancing work that needed to happen. Um, they posted materials. They exchanged ideas. I felt like that's where, for me, as, a, um, as an instructor, to look at the global classroom came alive, really, in the discussion groups. About, I, from, what the from the, what my technical assistant told me, is about a third of the students actually use the discussion forum. So not everybody uses them, but those that do use them really open up the course. So lots of discussion around what methods are you using in your country? How have you been able to access this? So that whole, that whole discussion for me was very rich and, and, and uh, really helped create that um, you know, global classroom. A lot of student-led um, study groups also popped up. So there were study groups for Spanish speakers, Portuguese speakers. Uh, there were, these are some of the examples. Uh, midwives from all over the world created their own study group. There were study groups of, that created, for, there were non-clinicians, non-clinician educators, and then uh, there was a layperson study group, as well as there was one called the Youngin study group, where it was most of the young uh, high school age uh, students that were taking the course as well, and then they were able to have their own discourse while they were um, uh, looking at the content as well. So it was very fascinating. And one of the things I really, um, in, in again, this was a pilot, I, I, my expectations, I had why I was open to anything coming forward, but with a, with a topic like contraception, I, was, I felt, oh my goodness, there's going to be a lot of controversy perhaps, you know, and I, it really was, a, uh, there wasn't much in terms of fire and controversy. There was a lot of great open discussion around uh, all the different methods, and, I, and it was a very mature discussion, and it might have, it felt very good. Um, what is another highlight? I just want, uh, to, uh, my, lost my train of thought, but, but, but basically a very important uh, topic, and, and for me it's the reach that was very important. There were folks that were giving me uh, feedback around that this was something that they needed to go then the next day and teach in their village about this particular method, and they were happy to have updated and evidence-based material uh, around these uh, topics. Bill, you have slides? Yeah, there they are. Thank you. Thank you.
Bill Brieger from Johns Hopkins. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you all could be here. It's a very massive, exciting experience with over 400 people around uh, who are interested in this topic of, of trying to get education out to everyone. And as we've seen from the previous slides, from the uh, before the keynote speakers, uh, the organizers talking about their reach to 190 some countries. I didn't even realize there were that many countries right now. Um, the course I put up uh, called uh, Community uh, Change in Public Health was actually a module in an existing course that I taught at, teach at Hopkins, but this existing course has evolved over the years. Um, actually first starting in 1976 when I was fortunate enough to be hired onto the faculty of the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine at the University of Ibadan. And so basically the course grew out of African experiences. We had students from all over the continent and one of the first things we were talking about accents, um, many people did not speak Balmerese. I'm from Balmer. <laughs> Just down the road here, about 80 miles. <laughs> and uh, so learning a lot, learning a lot about communication, learning a lot about humor. Um, and uh, so this is, again, the history of the course coming out of an international uh, perspective. This is an interesting thing I just saw on the internet yesterday and wanted to share with you. I'm not going to talk about it, but the idea of this international reach of uh, MOOCs um, being able to customize education around the world, and I want to talk about that in a minute, being able to learn from the experience to improve courses, the data. You've already seen uh, Jerusalem showing some of the, the, her own data. And people organizing and learning together. And this, I think, is an important thing. We try to uh, foster that in uh, our courses at Hopkins. And um, some of the things that, again, I want to consider, and then I'll go into some of the details, is again, the issue of language. We have people who can uh, come from all over the world. So uh, if many of our courses are in English and they're in other uh, languages too, uh, how do we make them accessible to people? How do they understand what, it, what it's meant? Now, like I said, I've learned uh, over the years when I lecture to students in, in Nigeria that I have to speak differently. I wouldn't say I speak special English that the Voice of America used to have. That would put you to sleep in the morning when you first turned it on. Uh, but one thing that uh, Jerusalem also mentioned is that students with different language uh, interests and cultural interests do come together in uh, different forums to share what they've learned. One of the interesting things, in addition to a regular forum, uh, our students created their own Facebook page. This was not a large number of students. I think at one point we had about 190. Um, there were about 7,500 people who were supposedly active on the course. That's about half of the people that signed up. There, the funnel that they talked about, I have uh, my own slide to show that. It, it's very, very true. Not everybody gets actively involved. Um, but the interesting thing was that this Facebook page uh, did attract people from all over the world, and uh, it was in a way of actually much more interaction than we had on our on our regular forum on the course itself. And this is something you have to think about. Again, not everybody is on Facebook, or those that are may not want to get involved, but it was an interesting opportunity. One thing that we have to think about is assessment. We've talked about peer assessments, but the key issue um, in Nigeria in the medical school, 50% was pass mark. Undergraduate education, 40% was pass mark. Our US system considers 70% a pass mark in most cases, uh, possibly 60 for Ds in some cases, but if you can't, if you get too many Ds, you're out. <laughs> and so uh, this is something we have to think about um, because there are people who are used to you know, I mean, the, the concept I was told when I first got to Nigeria is that, well, it's humanly impossible for anyone to know everything. So you can't expect people to get, I mean, 70, 70, oh, that's excellent, you know. And so it was a whole different way of thinking about things. And so, again, we have to think about what are our students expecting. Um, again, this is just an example of some of the uh, communication we see from people from around the world. Uh, but also, I think the... Uh, it shows, again, with the, with the second one, is the, the question of language skills and the implications. Some people, of course, read better than they speak. Um, we have 
um, experience with many of our courses at Hopkins. I teach only online at Hopkins. I teach uh, three different courses. And uh, we do have situations where st you know, students have difficulty maybe with the lectures, but with the reading material, you know, they're, they're, they can manage quite well in English. And so we have different learning uh, abilities. And just to reiterate what Jerusalem said, having uh, online free downloadable links is an extremely important thing that we've used. I only had one complaint that somebody said their bandwidth was such that it cost too much money to download things. But other than that, uh, we did have um, quite a lot of um, you know, free access materials. And then again, we had a multilingual discussion groups going on in terms of Spanish, Portuguese primarily. Um, we want to encourage that. Again, monitoring that as, a, uh, as an instructor or you know, if you have a teaching assistant is going to be challenging. I should mention that Coursera is thinking about, well, they already have started it, where people who have taken your course once and they perform well can come on as part of the senior members of the community to help uh, facilitate discussion groups. And this is going to be an interesting thing we'll try, and we may therefore look for people with different language skills to help facilitate uh, these processes. And of course, so we have some people who in addition to using Google Translate, have uh, tried on their own to um, communicate with other members of the class who are international. And I think this idea of communicating with each other is something I stress in my main courses, and that is you're not here to learn from me, but you're, we're all here to learn together, try to set up opportunities for people to learn from each other. Uh, the forums, depending on how you structure them in Coursera, can encourage people to share experiences and comment on each other's experience. The peer assessment, of course, offers an opportunity for people reading other people's assignments and learning how they perceive and see things. In the future, I hope we can move toward what we're doing in uh, my courses at Hopkins is we use what we call the bulletin board, which is the same thing as the forum, to have, have actual uh, exercises assignments, learning, where people actually contribute something and other people are expected to comment on that so that they really do learn from each other. Right now there's no way of, quote, grading that or giving points to that because all of the forum stuff gets lumped together when you try to do data analysis. Um, but I think we're going to try some of that. I'm starting the second run of the course uh, in about two weeks and I'm going to see if we can get some of these senior community members, as it were, uh, volunteers to, to help facilitate the discussion uh, groups and see if we can at least try it out and without grades, but try it out and see if we can get it going. Um, here's our Facebook group, uh, just a few people, but they're from everywhere um, and actively participating. Um, even the over on uh, the right side is the son of one of my former colleagues in Nigeria who's now in medical school himself and took the course. So uh, I guess my Nigerian connections uh, help in terms of recruitment. Also in terms of recruitment, um, I have an international mailing list on malaria, an international Facebook page on malaria, and a Twitter account on malaria. Uh, so attracting international students and, and people interested in public health and advertise, you know, the course when it's coming up. And just what you can see with the um, Facebook is that one of the nice things is on a page you can see how many people are actually looking at it. And the students do not only share news, but they talk about it, they like or comment on what each other put up. So this is a much more interactive and can be pictorial. And again, as we mentioned, we have study groups uh, from different countries and in different languages. We want to encourage more of that so students learn from each other. So basically, our challenge today is discussing how we can maximize this international learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's throw the floor open now uh, to comments from any of you. Yes, yeah, uh, Peter Bull at Harvard University. And I, I've been working and teaching a course in Chinese history. But one of the, uh, his, my impression is that, in fact, the uptake among various countries in the world, China has been very slow to, uh, to have subscribers. And I, I was wondering whether we actually have good data on the breakdown by country for people who are taking MOOCs.
Do we? Is, does anyone know? Yeah, actually. Tom, do you want to take that? <laughs> I'm Tom Doe. I'm actually a head of analytics at Coursera. Huh. Um, so we actually do have some amount of data on this. Uh, it's available through a number of different means. Uh, one is, uh, for a lot of our students, we have uh, a profile that you can fill out so you can state what country you're from. But also, since we track IP addresses, yeah, right. we can also try to infer what country you're from based on the IP address as well. Do you publish, and you publish that data? Uh, yes. So, so, so in general, I, I guess sort of the rough estimate is that you know, about a third of our students are from the US. And then, uh, depending upon the class, there are actually quite a range of different uh, geographic distributions. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if I have any great general sense of what types of topics tend to attract specific countries, but there is quite a lot of differences. We, uh, um, we actually conducted a mid-course survey in my class that had um, 4,600 responses, so it's a pretty good sample size. and. Um, I would say that um, n does, not, is, does not reflect the standard profile that Daphne outlined in her talk. Uh, probably somewhat more uh, North America, heavily in South America, Latin America, also Europe. Uh, significant numbers in Asia, the Middle East, and, uh, um, and, Af and some Africa, but not in the kind of proportions that Daphne is describing, which imp implies to me that courses in the humanities and social sciences may be a little more weighted in their distribution towards uh, countries that are closer to the Atlantic world, while a lot of the courses that they're offering in these more technical subjects are drawing very heavily from some of these students in places like China and India. The, the analytics you were mentioning, are they available on a course-by-course -course basis to the instructors through some report that I just haven't discovered yet? No, they're not currently available through a report, but it's something that we can actually generate on a per-course basis based on the IP addresses. So we just we just request that and we provide it. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'm Greg from UW Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, so when you when we start talking about people from different countries and the problem with um, language, you mentioned transcriptions that came up a couple of times. So um, how are you really working through transcribing, <coughs> putting up different versions of it in different languages, captioning it in different ways, or are you just kind of leaving the students work through the discussion groups in different areas to kind of help one another um, translate what the languages are? And I'm speaking primarily about the videos in this case that are spoken in English and how you're really working through that. Well, the, uh, I'll, I can speak for my case, and then others can address what they know about the transcription process. And their the Coursera people may be able to shed some light on this, too. We are not doing our English language transcripts ourselves. Coursera is providing the transcription. Um, my guess is they are doing some sort of machine-generated process in which humans may intervene to some degree, but um, <laughs> it, it provides um, a, a rough product that's, uh, however, none, as I stressed, I discovered is uh, very important. But we were, on our end, the front end, relatively inattentive to the content of the transcripts. I'll, I'll add, which I did not mention in my initial remarks, that this therefore places uh, even more importance on what you're doing with your slides and what you're doing with your media so, in order to then uh, help bridge the gaps. But I do believe that it's then, uh, if, if we raise the level of the game on these courses, especially if you don't have the money to do the upfront investment in high quality transcripts, and then we're not paying for translations. And I don't know if Coursera is also doing machine generated translations of my course into other languages. I'm actually more curious about that now than I was a week ago. But um, uh, so I, my guess, no. The, uh, it's, it, it will be, it's very important then to be conscious of needing to make the investments in a second run once basically, um, if you don't have the money to do it up front, use their process to generate rough draft transcripts, then invest sums to get your transcripts up. If you then want to try to get those transcripts into other major world languages, you'll find that that's going to be a very significant investment. You may decide that that investment is worthwhile, but it's going to be a, it's a tough bar. So I should, I should be more clear in my question. We'll actually, I think we're good with the transcription process. I'm thinking more about, are you, are you actually providing the transcript 
in multiple languages within the course? Or you just put it out there in English and then make sure it's as accurate as possible? Certainly from my point of view, we have no intention of anything other than English. I think I might be inferring something different from your question, but if, if I go back to um, the programs that we run with credits for our distance learners, there are real issues where students are learning primarily in their own language and then they're being assessed right. in English language. Um, and while we're quite comfortable that students will cluster and discuss things in a physical sense or, or through virtual um, social media in their own language, that's absolutely fine. We wouldn't want to stop that. But I think we need to be very clear um, about what language they're really doing the learning in so that they can properly prepare themselves for assessment in English language. And there are lots of examples where there's been some local tuition on certainly the London programmes in the local language that has meant those students are not well prepared for assessment. So I think we need to be very careful. And if the transcript assumes something different right. to an employer or whoever is going to use that, I think we need to be quite careful about it. Okay. Thank you. And I think some of the things that are happening in my, my uh, course too there's a lot of for there's a good deal of foreign language activity occurring in the forums, and including meetups and so on where people are helping each other. But you, I think you now have a sense for kind of the core situation. Yes, yes, well, yes ma'am. Um, Molly Gore from the American Council on Education, and for the courses that we are evaluating the college credit worthiness of vocational lower division upper division graduate, um, and issuing those transcripts. They will be in multiple languages. So far, only five MOOCs um, have been evaluated. But I wanted to raise. I'm sorry. So ACE will want them in multiple languages. Is that? Am I hearing you right? Use them in multiple languages. For me, the word transcript. Yeah. Excuse me. Transcript. Yeah. I'm. I'm sorry. We can produce them. You can produce them. Languages. Yes. Yes. The transcripts. Of course. Oh, no, no. Well, the transcripts we're talking about are going to be hundreds of thousands of words long translating the spoken material in the course presentations. I thought you were talking about if only, If only we were talking about those kinds of transcripts. I wanted to, though, uh, follow up on something that Michael raised. Uh, because one of the biggest problems we face in American institutions is uh, that there's been a proliferation of courses, um, largely the result of uh, interests of faculty, and that has led to a much more difficult time to lay out a coherent path to a degree that reflects the things that we consider to be central to conferring a baccalaureate degree. You know, to have demonstrate intellectual skills with deep knowledge in the area of the major, to be able to communicate effectively the concepts in the major, to apply them um, in the real world, and so on. Um, do you want to say something about how you are accomplishing that from across countries and with the online courses? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to try to give a, a, a quick summary of that. But essentially, our curriculum is the same as what's delivered on campus at the University of London, probably colleges. So in other words, it has that same intellectual building process that's expected of the students. So critically for us, the academic standard is the same. And how they're assessed in that and how they achieve that uh, will be the same standard. But the quality of the learning um, process will be different. We want it to be a good learning process, of course, but we accept across international barriers it will need to be contextualized. And for an independent learner, it will be different to one who's got local tuition and support. But within that assessment, there are clear expectations of how the student will build their critical thinking, will build the ability to um, look at particular problems and find different solutions to see across different subject areas, that will be different. And across undergraduate, postgraduate, expectations will be different. I think the real challenge is for those institutions taking MOOCs and collectively giving them individual credits is that where does the, where does the thread 
of that intellectual building, particularly on an undergraduate program on thinking here, which I think I'm inferring is, is, is one of the key challenges for you as an accreditor. Um, and making sure that students understand what that's about, because for me, when I studied at university, that was the most critical thing I got out of it. Where does knowledge come from? I thought it was just taking a book and reading somebody, and the person who wrote that book had all of their knowledge, and all of the knowledge about that subject was covered there. So learning that it comes from different places, that it comes through a building process, that it comes by challenging and academics challenging that, is really critical. So, in other words, I think collections of portfolios of MOOCs can be very valuable for different purposes. When you're given credits and building them into a, in the UK, a 360 credit undergraduate degree, a bachelor of honours degree in our system, is very difficult unless there's that thread in the building around it. Now, my guess, without predicting institutions represented here and, and in the other arena, um, that is one of the challenges they'll be looking at in terms of the value-added process, if they were to take some of that content and produce that dialogue that builds that kind of critical awareness and, and intellectual and academic awareness of the subject. I'll just add that with respect to the Coursera and the MOOC environment, uh, I don't think your question is close to being addressed. We're, we're out of time. All right. Sorry. Well, in that case, um, we're out of time. We don't want to keep you from the next panel, and we thank you for attending this one.